How can we possibly simulate a living world? And if we do, what happens to the individual creatures that live in that world? I hope you stick around for this one. It's pretty wild. First, we need to talk about the new biome system for our simulation, which is based on the idea of ecological recycling. There's a ton of complexity here which I can't capture, at least not for now. So I'm going to just focus on two concepts, nutrient cycling and energy flow. Nutrient cycling explains the circulation of essential nutrients such as carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which are essential for the growth and survival of organisms. Energy flow focuses on how solar energy is captured, moves through an ecosystem, and is eventually released. In simplified terms, you can think about a pyramid, with plants at the bottom, herbivores sitting just on top of those, and increasingly predatory organisms at each level until you reach the top. Decomposers and sunlight sit outside the pyramid and feed the base. A critical difference is that nutrient cycling is a closed loop, which is capable of recycling 100% of the nutrients that move through an ecosystem, and it can do this indefinitely. Energy flow is the opposite. Energy comes into an ecosystem as sunlight and leaves as heat or locomotion or other things, mostly heat. So how can we simulate this? We basically just need to add some additional logic to our tiles and our creatures. We'll start with producers, which consume energy from the sun and take nutrients from the soil. The producers produce plant waste and feed herbivores which produce both animal waste and meat. Meat is consumed by predators who also produce animal waste and meat, and meat produces its own kind of waste as well. All this waste is consumed by decomposers, which return nutrients to the soil. Finally, organisms are all moving around and doing stuff, which causes energy to leave the system. In reality, energy should also leave the system at the producer stage, but this is handled in code by simply assuming that the amount of energy which enters the system is the net amount rather than the total. To see this in action, we're going to change the size of plants on tiles based on two factors, the current plant mass on the tile and the current rate of regrowth. Plant mass is simply the total amount of plants which exist on a tile right now, and rate of regrowth is a little more nuanced. We take the total number of plant decomposers and the total number of animal decomposers, with populations being driven by the amount of available waste, and multiply each of these by a biodiversity rating. For animals, biodiversity is calculated based on the number of unique species that are depositing waste. For plants, it's basically just a function of how well the ratio of plant decomposers reflects the ratio of plant types in a given ecosystem. Which brings us to another topic. To make this system work, I had to completely rework the diet system. The changes are pretty extensive, so I'm going to save the detail for another video or else we're going to miss the entire simulation. For now, there are nine types of plant food. Different biomes have different ratios. These, along with meat, give creatures 10 sliders which range from 0 to 1, and they all start at 0.1, i.e. a perfect omnivore. They can move up or down in increments of 0.1, but they must always add up to a total value of 1. The higher the value, the more efficient the creature is with that food type. Now, let's get into the good stuff. Epoch 1 is dominated by a basic pig build. These are fairly large, slow omnivores, which of course means they include meat in their diet. And as you can see, some of them have even started hunting. The pig builds spread out over the southern half of our environment with a little bit of variation. Note that the only point where they could cross into the northern hemisphere is here, so they spend quite a bit of time exclusively in the south. As you can see, the areas where they frequent have significantly healthier vegetation, which is driven by the faster regrowth their waste enables. At around 25,000 turns, the map is still dominated by pigs, but we also have an increasing population of red deer, which are our first herbivores. Note this doesn't mean that there's no variation in the deer's diet, it just means they've lost all interest in meat specifically. We also have a couple of these red river hogs, which honestly I was amazed are real. They look more like an anime forest spirit than they do a real animal. This is fitting because they, for some reason, seem to be an omen for change in this simulation, but more on that later. From this point, we start to see a real breakdown of the farm pig population, and by 40,000 terms, we have a large population of deer and a bunch of these cute little pygmy hogs. There are also a few warthogs hanging around, and we have quite a bit of variation in the remaining pig population. This is a good sign, because it means the environment is capable of supporting lots of different strategies, so we should see some interesting interactions. Finally, we have a small group of animals that has managed to cross into the northern hemisphere and survive for a few rounds which marks the start of Epoch 2. The standard pig build expands rapidly into its new environment, while the southern hemisphere is taken over by warthog builds, which are smaller and reproduce more slowly, but which have higher speed, perception, and stealth. And we have a few others dotted around. By 60,000 turns, the south is having a war between the small to mid-sized omnivore builds, with four major representations of this strategy and numerous minor variations. Meanwhile, the north is looking pretty familiar, with larger omnivores being the most successful strategy, followed by mid to large herbivores. This may be an example of convergent evolution with the stimulus being an untapped environment. At around 63,000 turns, these guys show up again. So let's look around for something weird. And sure enough, we have this gigantic freak of nature. Now you might be thinking, it's not that big, but consider the fact that this is the only one of these in the map and it's actually a pygmy hog. It's pretty weird. Anyway, this is pretty much the state of the world until Epoch 3, 
with the only notable thing being that herbivores gain a bit more of a foothold in the north, and we can even see a smaller build arise for a brief moment. But anyway, let's move on to Epoch 3. At the start of Epoch 3, we see a rapid return to the farm pig meta, although the north and south are split on the best size. This stays pretty consistent for a long time, although there are a few brief noteworthy mentions. At around 100,000 turns, we can see the small omnivore build making a bit of a comeback, but this is short-lived as the entire world settles on the mid to large farm pig build. At around 150,000 turns, the giant pygmy hogs have a go at becoming viable, and of course we have our little spirit pigs cheering them on, but it wasn't meant to be. The world turns back to smaller, faster builds, and by 175,000 turns we can see a big group of these coming from the Midwest, which marks the start of Epoch 4. Starting in the south, we see a rapid move towards stealth, which is quickly mirrored in the north, seemingly irrespective of build or playstyle. The most interesting part is that we can see a whole bunch of lesser epochs happening underneath the umbrella of the stealth pig age. We have the warthog south and the rise of European boars in the north, followed by a massive takeover from Red River hogs in the south and tiny sloth bears up north. This is followed up with a resurgence in the boar population in the north, along with a rare spectacled bear, and an array of small omnivores in the south, all with ridiculous stealth ratings. Note that one thing we can really see now is the difference in vegetation on different tiles. It's interesting that the most fertile areas are those that are dominated by larger creatures. I don't have any specific data on this, but I do have a theory. Larger creatures are more likely to consume everything on a tile, leave a bunch of waste, and then move to another tile, which basically leaves a trail of fertility while also providing plants some time to grow. Smaller creatures are more likely to have a constant presence on a tile since they are less likely to out-eat the rate of regrowth. This means they are more likely to find a balance where vegetation never reaches 100% of its maximum mass, but is also never reduced to zero. Let me know what you think in the comments. Anyway, these mini epochs continue until around turn 280,000, when we enter Epoch 5. Epoch 5 brings a return to what seems to be the most stable build for this environment, farm pigs. The simulation terminates itself at 300,000 turns, which is around 9 hours in real time, so there isn't much to this epoch. So let's just think about what happened overall. I remember checking in on the simulation as it was running, and being surprised by the fact that stealth became such a driving force, irrespective of all other factors. Except... It didn't. There were early hints that something else was going on. We first saw bears get a significant foothold around turn 57,000, and they popped up again and again throughout the simulation. When we saw this, we should have thought about perception. Bears have some of the keenest senses in the animal kingdom, including a sense of smell that's seven times better than a bloodhound. Looking at the data, we can see that perception was on the rise for essentially the entire simulation, but there was a particular spike around turn 130,000. This is the same time that stealth really started to take off, and from there, they went into a bit of an arms race. But I don't think either one was actually driving the other, because there's actually one more piece to the puzzle. Around the same time, the average affinity for meat nearly tripled, which meant the world suddenly became a lot more dangerous. Stealthy predators simultaneously obtained an offensive advantage against prey through ambush, and a defensive advantage over predators because they could simply avoid them. Meanwhile, perceptive animals could avoid ambush, or combat altogether, and they could easily find whatever prey or carry-on they wished to pursue. Speed also played a critical role, but it was ultimately overtaken by the other two. This may be because it takes a lot more energy to be fast than just to be perceptive or stealthy. I thought there was a really good lesson here about relying too heavily on what you can see, because it's probably only a partial view. But anyway, to sum up, we built a living environment in which creatures, plants, and decomposers all had an impact on each other. This environment appears to have been well suited to omnivores, though we did see some herbivores and creatures were, on average, becoming more specialist over time, including for meat. Had the simulation run longer, we might have even seen some obligate carnivores. The environment favored stealthy perceptive creatures with smaller size and moderate rates of reproduction. And we saw a few oddities, which is always nice. If you like my content, please hit subscribe. It really helps the channel and, to be honest, I just really want a YouTube play button. If you want to support me more directly, feel free to join my Patreon or YouTube membership, where you can get some cool perks. Alternatively, if you don't want to sign up for anything, you can hit the super thanks button wherever it is on your device. Please only consider giving me money if you're financially stable. If you have to give up anything more than a coffee or a takeout, then please don't give me money. You've already paid with your time, and I appreciate it greatly. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.